I'm always interested in uh, display technologies because I love gadgets and I keep hearing rumors of high-res iPad screens coming soon someday but here I have a company in my room who has a way to make the image much better quality without increasing the pixel count and that's NanoSys we're gonna hear about it right now <laughs> Who are you? Uh, my name is Jason Hartlove. I'm president and CEO of Nanosys. Um, I've been working in uh, high tech for about 22 years. Worked 18 years at uh, Hewlett Packard and Agilent Technologies and brought a bunch of products out to market. And now with uh, Nanosys, we hope to bring some new revolutionary new display components to market. Well, it, you know, I, I've been seeing demos for the last couple minutes and it's quite remarkable. Unfortunately, our cameras can't really capture what you guys do. Yeah. But Tell me what you do anyways. Yeah, sure. So, you know, with LCDs, which is the very common uh, lighting uh, display technology today, you have a backlight behind a panel, and that backlight produces a, a white light. And that white light comes through the panel where the pixels are located, and those pixels flicker on and off to let the light come through. At each location, there's a little filter at each pixel location, and that, that pixel is either a red, filtered or green filtered or blue filtered pixel. So you either get a red, green, or blue color at each pixel location. Now the quality of the red, green, and blue that you get depends directly on the quality of that white light you have in the back. And so if that white light, for example, if you if you lit up that display with a yellow light, right, and then you turn those pixels on and off, you wouldn't get very good color. If you turned, if you, on the other hand, put something in the backlight there that looked like daylight, right, you get very good color. And so the challenge is, how do you make a good white light in the backlight for LCD displays? And that's really what we do. So you just have a better white light bulb behind all these pixels? Yeah, not exactly. What we do is we use the existing LED technology that's out there, which is the so-called gallium nitride LED. And this LED has become very, very good over the last five to 10 years. It's gotten very efficient. It's what you see in all the LED light bulbs, et cetera. The problem is this LED is basically blue. And so to make white light from this blue LED source, which is very efficient at converting electrons into photons, what you have to do is use a phosphor. And the phosphor that people generally have been using have been so-called yellow YAG phosphors. What we have is a very unique phosphor. And unlike the YAG phosphor, we can make any color of fluorescence that our customer asks us to make. And this is called the quantum dot phosphor. What are you showing me here? So this is a demonstration of our quantum dot phosphor materials. And this isn't our product, this is just a little demo kit. And so what we have is that gallium nitride source LED that we talked about earlier and how it's nice and very efficient at converting. And it's very blue. You can it's see very it. blue. Yep. And so what we do is we stimulate the phosphor with this and we can, for example, create a very nice green color, right? But using the exact same material, this same indium phosphide material, we can also create one that fluoresces in the yellow or in the orange or in the red. And by specifically controlling the synthesis process during which we make these different phosphors, we can uniquely control those wavelengths of emission. Now by taking a very good quality of green and mixing it with a very good quality of red and a very good quality of blue, we can make a unique red, green, blue backlight system, which effectively is white light, but it's very pure white light specifically designed for the display. And so the color saturation that comes out and your ability to accurately render colors is tremendously improved. So the, the demos you've been showing me, the reds are deeper, are more vibrant. The greens are more, look more like the leaves on trees. They're, exactly. they're just pure and, and more deep. That's why it's so hard to demo on a right. camera because we're using a camera and then you're viewing it on an old style right, right, LED right, monitor, right. right? Which doesn't have this new technology. Exactly, exactly. So it's quite interesting because the capture device, the camera that we're using here today, actually is capturing much wider range of color. 
the limitation and the, and the whole pipeline through the internet all the way out to the user is actually processing a relatively large gamut of color. The real limitation on uh, the user experience today is that display, that end device. And so your viewable content is, is pretty good, but your actual ability to view it is pretty bad. So for example, uh, you know, you talked about the, the iPad there. You know, one of the measures is there's a standard for color rendering called the NTSC broadcast standard. And this broadcast standard defines the color spectrum that broadcast content should have as it's sent out over the airwaves. And HD has a standard and there are various other standards out there. So when we measure the ability of a device like an iPad or another tablet to render color, it can render about half of the NTSC color gamut. Wow. And that's it, right? So there's fully 50% of the colors that are out there, right, that aren't being accurately rendered to the user they just by these away. devices. Yeah, they're being truncated or corrupted into, you know, red becomes orange or green becomes yellow, et cetera, these types of things. We can take that same technology that's in the display and just by changing one component, the phosphor component, we can change that to 100% of the NTSC standard. So when am I going to see this in the tablets and big screen TVs? How far away from the market is this? Yeah, so our plans are to have our first uh, product in the market with this technology uh, in the sort of tablet notebook size form factor at the end of this year. We're working with a major consumer goods manufacturer and the display manufacturers, et cetera, to make that happen. And then we'll be scaling that up to larger size panels, television size panels, et cetera, next year. And in particular, you know, we hope to have some very, uh, very stunning uh, demonstrations of, of large scale panels for the Olympics. Ooh. Uh, and I'm going to go down to Vizio in a couple of days uh, <laughs> and take a tour of their factory down, there, down in L.A. And I'll talk with them about what their plans are going to be. But sure. I, I have a feeling you're going to have a, a bunch of displays at the Consumer Electronics Show in January showing off the differences between. Because yeah. it's quite stark. When you see this, yeah. it's like, whoa, that's really much better. Right. It makes your eye think it's a higher resolution screen. Yeah. So there's a lot of science behind things like what's called the... HK effect or Helmholtz Kohlrusch effect, named for the two guys who discovered it, that has to do with the perception of the quality of an image as a function of the purity of the colors that are in the image. And it goes to things like this. Your, your perception of contrast goes up, your perception of brightness goes up, all of these things. And it really has to do with the, the brain and the way the brain processes images. We're not used to seeing these sort of faded, washed out images because they haven't really existed during our evolution. Yeah. You know, we were used to seeing things in daylight and when we start illuminating them with these poor quality lights, you don't get that same sort of response and our, our brains just aren't yet evolved to process them uh, in the same way. So you're exactly right. You get the all these impressions of much higher fidelity of the image beyond just the color, um, which is what we've really improved. Does this change the price <coughs> of the uh, display that you're going to sell? No. Our goal is to make this absolutely cost neutral in terms of the bill of materials for the display manufacturer. So and how do you guys get paid then? Well, what we're actually doing is we're not in the business of making LEDs. So our instantiation or our, the way we implement this is we actually make a sheet of film. And as you may know, in the making of LCDs, there's the backlight, then there's several sheets of film that specifically try and control what the light is doing. So for example, there's one in there called a brightness enhancing film. And its goal is to really make sure that most of the light comes out directly towards the viewer, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of just shooting in every direction. Now for televisions, it also will put some of the light out so that you have a good viewing angle this way. But in the vertical direction, the viewing angle is not critical because yeah. people don't stand above their TV and look at it. So again, it's trying to shape this into you know, a particular way to come out so that you get them all the light going where you want it to go. That's the purpose of these films. One of these films is called the diffuser. We actually replace the diffuser. We take the diffuser out of the film stack. And we insert our film in place of it. We don't use white LEDs. We use the blue LEDs, which is the blue 
same LED but no YAG phosphor. And then that's how you get the, the effective color coming out. We sell that sheet to the display manufacturer in place of the diffuser. And that's how we get paid. This technology can be used on 3D devices as well? So you can Any switch color it device. on and off just yes. the same? same Any way. color device, no matter what the size of the pixel, the resolution of the pixel, whether or not it's 3D, 2D, etc. Any color device is going to benefit greatly from this technology. So, color LCD device. So why won't every uh, tablet manufacturer use this uh, as soon as possible? Well, we're hoping they will. We're yeah. working with them to try and make that happen. Tell me a little bit about the company. How, how are you yeah. guys funded and, and sure. uh, what's, the, what's the state your company's yeah. in? We're a late stage venture back company. We're uh, 10 years old, um, uh, our 10th anniversary coming up. So this is probably not your only product, is it? It's not our only product, yeah. yeah. We, uh, we have some uh, other very interesting materials for lithium ion batteries that improve the uh, energy storage capacity of lithium ion batteries and a number of other products that we've worked on and uh, have brought to market. We've got um, <clears throat> about 100 employees here in uh, Palo Alto in Silicon Valley. Um, we do all of our chemistry uh, development as well as our manufacturing uh, here in the U.S. And then we actually take the, the chemistry and we make it into things like films. We do that with contract manufacturers and other partners. Um, so we're not, we don't have a huge coding business, for example. That's not really our competency. Our competency is in these nanomaterials that have these very unique properties that allow our leading edge customers to bring new capabilities into their devices. How many patents do you have on this uh, technology? On this technology, we have about 400 patents. 400? Yes, and overall in the company, we have about 750. <laughs> How do you get 400 patents out of a little LED light? That's, like, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah. So our patent estate goes back to the very early days of the creation of this technology um, and some of the early scientific founders, such as uh, Dr. Munji Buendi out of MIT and uh, Dr. Paul Alvisados out of uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. And it really starts with what is a quantum dot? And then it gets into how do you make a quantum dot? And then what materials are useful for a quantum dot and what the different structures are? And then what their particular ways that you put them into components such as films or optical components, et cetera. So it's, it's a, actually a very complex little optical system that we've built here. Um, it, it seems very simple. But to get the kind of uniformity and the color performance and the purity and the high efficiency, there's a lot of work that's gone into this. Very, very substantial work by some brilliant people. I, I have no idea if you're having conversations with Apple, but I, 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 my brother-in-law used to work there. And I bet one of the conversations that a company like that would have with you is, can you make enough for 100 million tablets? Yeah. Because so. the next uh, tablet, you know, the <clears throat> Pad 3 will probably sell somewhere in that neighborhood. Right? Yeah, that's what we call a high quality of problem. <laughs> um, and uh, the answer is yes. So we've scaled our, our process up to a point where we're supporting, um, at, our, at our product launch, at the end of this year, we'll be supporting tens of thousands of these units a month on our way to supporting millions per month and on the way to, from there to tens of millions of units per month. Of course, we you know, have to uh, go there a step at a time. We can't just jump to 100 million units. But, uh, you know, it all looks very good in terms of the process, stability of the process, the manufacturing window, et cetera, our yields. So all these things uh, look very respectable at this point. And you can make them in sizes up to 70, 80 inches as well? Yeah, that's our goal, uh, again, for the, the sort of Olympic uh, showcase, is to make them in sizes large enough to do an 80-inch sort of display. Does um, it change the power utilization <clears throat> at all? Actually, our goal is to bring the uh, color performance up to like 100% of NTSC or, or even beyond that a little bit and have no impact on the power. Okay, um, so the, the customers frequently ask us, well, you know, can you use this technology to, to save a little bit of power? And the answer is yes, but that's really not a good way to use the technology. In point of fact, you know, the battery life of an iPad today is pretty good, right? Yeah. I mean, at 10 hours. 
and we could either bring this level of color to the iPad, or we could give you an extra half hour of battery life. And an extra half hour of battery life doesn't really seem like, you know, the big, big way to really no. leverage the quality or capability of this technology. Especially because we're watching more and more movies, we're looking at more and more photos, right. and our cameras are getting better. I mean, I, Canon's going to come out with a new 5D soon. Right. You know, and that's that thing already today has a 22 megapixel sensor in it. Absolutely. I can't even display all the resolution right. of my camera on these right. things. Right, right. Very interesting. I, I have no idea why Steve Jobs let you come over and talk to me. <laughs> but uh, no comment. <laughs> but I, I want I want one. Can you put one of these things in my my iPad? Absolutely. All right. <laughs> yeah, we'll do a retrofit for you. Thank you so All much. Right. By you. the way, where can we learn more and watch uh, you guys? www.nanosysinc.com. N a n o s y s i n c dot com. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.